Well, I want to begin with, um, by giving you some lyrics to a relatively well-known cultural song. And I uh, just want you to raise your hand when you, when you know which song I'm talking about, okay? And if you're in the worship cafe, you can do the same thing. Just raise your hand, and I'll pretend I'm pointing to you. All right. Just sit right back and you hear a tale, a tale of a fateful trip that started from this tropic port aboard this tiny ship. Anyone? All together? Gilligan's Island, right? The mate was a mighty sailing man, a skipper, brave and sure. Five passengers set sail that day for a three-hour tour, a three-hour tour. The weather started getting rough. The tiny ship was tossed. If not for the courage of the fearless crew, the minnow would be lost. The minnow would be lost. Now, if you're like me, Gilligan's Island was kind of a staple of childhood, at least my childhood, you know, peanut butter and jelly, mac and cheese on Wednesday nights. I still don't know why we always had mac and cheese on Wednesday, night, Wednesday nights, but we did. Um, and you can still hear that song in your head. Some of you could probably start singing it right now, and it's going to be there the rest of the evening. You're welcome. <laughs> Quick question. How many seasons did Gilligan run before it went into syndication? Just three. 1964 to 1967, just three years, and then it went into syndication. Doesn't it seem like it was on forever? Gilligan's Island? Or maybe you were a fan of a different show, Lost in Space. Any Lost in Space fans? You're as old as I am, or close to as old as I am. Science fiction show about the Robinson family and the creepy Dr. Smith, right? And of course the robot who kept shouting, danger Will Robinson, danger. Or maybe you're not exactly from my generation, you have no idea what I'm talking about so far. Maybe you're a fan of a show like Lost. Any Lost fans here? Now, Lost was really just Gilligan's Island on steroids, right? If you, if you watch the show, same thing, Lost on an Island, Lost in Time and Space. The popularity of those kinds of shows tells us a couple things. First of all, it tells us there's a lot of ways to get lost. There's a lot of ways to get lost. That's true. But secondly, it tells us that being lost, while it seems exciting and interesting, it's only exciting and interesting until you are, in fact, lost, and then it's not much fun at all. Two weeks ago, we finished the great story of Jesus' death and resurrection. We celebrated on Easter weekend. And then uh, last week, we jumped into a new series. Kind of went back a little bit into the story, specifically to look at Jesus the teacher and his teachings that are called parables. We're in the second week of a series called Kingdom Stories, the Parables of Jesus. Last week, Jeff taught us about one of his most well-known parables, the parable of the Good Samaritan. And today we're going to look at yet another very well-known story of Jesus, and it's a story about being lost. And before I read the story to you, um, I want to give you a little bit of background. Luke begins chapter 15 in his gospel by setting the stage for the story we're going to look at tonight. And it's really important that we set the stage because Jesus told this story at this time to this audience for a specific reason, and Luke gives us that reason early on in this chapter. So Luke 15, in verses 1 and 2, Luke tells us, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear him. Verse 2, And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. I'm going to stop there before we even get to the story. Luke is telling us Jesus is dealing with two very different groups of people here. On the one hand, there are what Luke calls the tax collectors and sinners. Now, who were they? Now, by this time in Jesus' ministry, he had developed quite a reputation of befriending and spending time with people like Zacchaeus. Remember little Zacchaeus, the tax collector, uh, who climbed up in the tree to see Jesus, and Jesus invited him to his house? He was a tax collector. People like Matthew eventually became Matthew the disciple, but was a tax collector early in his life. Now, tax collectors were, were reviled in their own culture. They were Jewish men who were basically serving the Romans and themselves by taxing their fellow Jews and skimming some off the top. So they were distrusted and disliked. But Jesus went to their homes, he befriended them, and through the relationship they established with Jesus, they were transformed. We like to say here, that the gospel transforms people, and transform people make an impact in the world. You see that in the stories of Zacchaeus and the story of Matthew. Jesus also, in John chapter 8, uh, stood in front of a woman who had been accused of and been caught in the act of adultery. And she's being stoned by some righteous men. 
And Jesus steps in front and says, let him, him who is without sin cast the first stone. And they all go away, and he looks at this woman, and he says, does no one condemn you? And then he says, neither do I, go and sin no more. So Jesus had established a reputation of befriending people who were essentially irreligious, people who were far from God. And word had gotten out, a different kind of rabbi is here, a different kind of preacher is here, a different kind of holy man is here, and irreligious people were flocking to hear him preach and teach. Now the second group Luke, Luke mentions is a very different group. He says, and the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling. Now the Pharisees and scribes were among the most religious people of the day. So you had the irreligious and you have the very religious. These were men who were devoted to the law of God, as they understood through the Old Testament. They were devoted to interpreting the religious law and to enforcing the religious law. They were among the most educated people of their day, and quite often they were among the most affluent and powerful people as well. They also, as we know from the New Testament writings, tended to be self-righteous. That is, they were convinced of their own goodness and proper standing. They tended to look down on others who were not quite as righteous as they were, not quite as devoted to religious laws as they were. They also resented Jesus. They had grown to resent Jesus because they didn't think he showed appropriate regard for their position. Uh, they resented his popularity, his growing popularity, with people they regarded as sinners and unworthy. And Jesus knew this. He knew why the Pharisees and scribes were grumbling. So the scene is set, the stage is set. And in Luke 15, with both of these groups listening for different reasons, Jesus tells three stories in rapid succession, each building on the one before. First, he tells a story about a shepherd who has a hundred sheep. One of them is lost. He leaves the 99 and goes searching for the one lost sheep. And he concludes the story by saying there is more joy in heaven for one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. And then he moves to a second story. He tells a story about a woman who has 10 coins. She loses one of those coins. And she turns her home upside down looking for that one lost coin. And when she finds it, she celebrates and Jesus comes to the same conclusion. He says, there is more jo there's joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And those two stories set up this third and most powerful story of being lost. Luke chapter 15, beginning in verse 11. And he said, there was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into the far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to, be, to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. I'm going to pause there. This is the part of the story that most of us immediately recognize. In fact, even people who aren't all that familiar with the Bible will recognize this part of the story. Uh, the prodigal son, the lost boy, the boy who in his immaturity and rebellion squanders his entire inheritance and winds up in the gutter. And everyone knows someone who is a prodigal. The story continues, verse 17. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough to bread? But I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring the fattened calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate, for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to celebrate. Now I'm going to pause here again. Remember the audience? Okay, who's Jesus talking to? Luke says one group is the tax collectors and sinners. 
They're flocking to hear what this new rabbi has to say. And what are they hearing right now as he tells this story? If they're paying attention, what are they hearing? They're hearing good news. They, they know they are the ones who've been far off. Who knows how long it's been since they went to the temple? Who knows how long since they could go in and offer their sacrifices? They're the ones who've been in the far country, far from God. And they're hearing there is a way home. There's a way back. There's hope even for us. But Jesus isn't finished with this story. Not by a long shot. Verse 25. Now his older son was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come. And your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, look, these many years I have served you and I've never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, son, you are always with me and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. Another question. Who else was listening to this story? You have the tax collectors and sinners over here. You also have the scribes and the Pharisees over here. What are they hearing in the story? Ouch. When Jesus starts the story, I think they're with him. He's telling the story of the younger brother, the one who was who squandered his inheritance. He winds up feeding pigs. They're saying, that's right, you tell them, Jesus. You tell, you, you tell those sinners over there. You tell them how they're going to wind up. They need to know that. And then he flips the script. He flips the story. And he tells a story about them. They realize they are the older brother. First thing to notice is that this story has been, I think, improperly named throughout the centuries. It's been called the parable of the prodigal son, singular, as if there's just one lost son in the story. The word prodigal means wastefully extravagant. And traditionally, that word has been applied only to the rebellious and foolish younger son. I think that's an incomplete description of the story. We're going to see that both sons are lost in their own way. And we're going to also see that the father is prodigal in his own way, wastefully extravagant in a different way. So first, let's talk about younger brother lostness. What is younger brother lostness? Years ago, our four boys were uh, much younger, and they were all playing outside one day. Maybe a day like today, all running around outside playing tag or hide-and-seek or baseball or whatever. And we're just getting dinner ready, and so time comes for them to come in for dinner. We holler, time to come in for dinner, and they eventually come trooping in, but only three out of the four come in. One is missing. And there are things in life where three out of four is really pretty good. <laughs> you know, baseball, three out of four gets you to the Hall of Fame. You know, three out of four is good. Three out of four is not good when it comes with your kids. So we're like, where's your brother? And they all look around, they're going, I, I don't know, he was with us a minute ago. I don't know, he was with us. Well, go find him. They go back out. They, look, they come back in, can't find him. We don't know where he is. What do you mean you don't know where he is? He's just in the yard. I don't know. We don't know where he is. So we all go out looking for him. We're looking all around. He's not in the yard. He's not in the backyard. He's not in the cul-de-sac. He's not in the other street going down. Where, where could he be? He was just with them. And then we hear a little voice, just a little voice. From around the, we walk around the side of the house. We're following the voice. We have one window well <laughs> next to our house. That's deep enough for like a six-year-old to be in without being able to climb out. And our youngest had been running, and he fell headlong into this window well. Remarkable, he didn't hurt himself, he's just, he, but he's just too tall for him to get out. He can't climb out. He's stuck. He's right next to our house. He can touch our house. He can look into the basement, but he's lost. I think that's what happens to the younger son. His lostness was unintentional. He didn't wake up one day and said to himself, you know, today would be a great day to ruin the rest of my life. He didn't say that. He didn't say, I think I'll take my inheritance and just blow it all on wild living. He wasn't trying to get lost. I think he was trying to find something. He was trying to find what he thought happiness was, joy, life. He was trying to find himself, and he thought the best way to get there was freedom 
from the old man. Freedom from dad, from the father. And I've seen it quite often in my career. A younger sibling struggles in some way to meet the expectations of mom or dad, maybe both. A younger sibling has an older brother or sister who's just a a straight-A student who's valedictorian, who's captain of the football team, and they realize, you know, there's no way I can really match up to that, so maybe, and they don't say this consciously, but just subconsciously, maybe I'll just become the best at being the worst. I've seen it happen. Proverbs tells us there is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end leads to death or destruction. I think that's what happens to the younger brother. His lostness is unintentional, but it is disastrous. Disastrous. Not fun to be lost. My freshman year in college, I became good friends with a classmate that I'll call Tim. We hit it off right away. You know, that freshman year, same floor, you come from different places, you're looking for someone you can talk to, or it's late at night, we just start talking, and and we just, we just hit it off. And, and one of our conversations we had early on was really about, about religion and God and, and found out I was a pastor's son. And we start talking. And, and he had grown up in a church-going family in the South, kind of a traditional church-going family. And, but by the time he got to college, he was questioning a lot of that. Uh, and we'd stay up late just talking about the, these things. And I learned that, that he just couldn't get past some of what he regarded as hypocrisy in the church that he grew up in. He said, I just don't understand how people can, how they can talk about that in church and then, then act this way outside of church. And it really bothered him. I remember him weeping because of that. He also couldn't get over some questions he had about the goodness of God. His older sister had been assaulted. She survived, but she'd been, she'd been assaulted in a crime. So he was struggling with those things. And eventually, like many college students, he, he started you know, having fun and going to parties on weekends, started drinking a little bit, just to feel a little less shy. He was kind of a shy kid and to have some fun. And to make a very, very long story short, by the end of our second year, our sophomore year, when we roomed together, he had started drinking enough every weekend that he'd be passed out at least one night of the weekend. Passed out. I remember trying to help him sober up one night. In the sh- I think I was holding him in the shower. And he was... He was um, crying and weeping and he was saying over and over again I don't want to be an alcoholic I don't want to be an alcoholic I don't want to be an alcoholic and that's exactly what happened he couldn't keep up with the studies dropped out of school the next year didn't graduate with our class and spent many years struggling with sobriety he didn't set out to get lost but he wound up in the far country that's what happens to this younger brother he didn't intend on it he just wanted to have some fun but he winds up Alone, destitute, desperate, eating with the pigs. Remember in that culture, pigs were the unclean, most unclean animal you could imagine. And he was longing to eat with them. It's, it's as disgusting a scene as you could imagine in that culture. In the far country, he's lost. Some of you here today know what it's like to live a portion of your life in the far country. You can remember that period of time. You know what it's like. Others of you Know someone right now in your friendship group, in your families, maybe someone you love very much who's in the far country, and you know what that's like. The younger brother's prodigal, wastefully extravagant in his foolishness and his rebellion. But notice, notice in the story, he finally recognizes his lostness. In verse 17, Jesus says, But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough to bread? But I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. This is a picture of repentance. Remember? The first two stories, there's more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents. Now, what is repentance? It's kind of a churchy-sounding word. To repent just means to turn around. It means a radical change in direction. It means to recognize the truth about yourself, to confess that truth, and to go in a new direction. The younger brother looks at his life. He looks where he is. He realizes what he's done, and he sees that the only hope for his life is repentance. So he surrenders his pride He gets up out of the pig pen and turns and he starts the long walk home. The only cure for younger brother lostness is repentance. Turning around and going home. Now, let's talk about older brother lostness. There's an older brother in the story. 
Many years ago when I was uh, serving as a uh, youth pastor, student pastor here at FBCG, we had just this campus. Didn't even have this building right now, just that part of it. And uh, I planned some sort of uh, event on a Saturday night with students. I can't remember anymore if it was junior high students or senior high students. I think senior high students. And it was a chance for kids to invite friends and come and have, have a lot of fun. And maybe it was an overnight. I can't remember what. But uh, a bunch of kids came, and a bunch of kids invited their friends, and there were a lot of kids who came who, who didn't go to church normally, whose families didn't go to church, weren't quite sure how to behave in church. And so we got through all that, everybody went home. Well, the next day I come to church, I'm standing in the lobby, and before the service, uh, a, a senior adult lady who is no longer uh, in, in our church came up to me with a very concerned look on her face. She told me that when she and her husband had parked in the parking lot, on the way in they noticed a bunch of cigarette butts in the parking lot. Uh, where they parked the car, uh, and she s- thought that, she wondered if I knew anything about that, and I said, well, I, we had an event last night, and I think a lot of kids invited their friends, and, and, and maybe, maybe they hung around afterward, and maybe that's, and we'll, we'll make sure we clean it up. Uh, she went on to say she didn't think it was appropriate for kids to be smoking in the church parking lot, wanted me to know that, and that I should make sure that those kinds of kids didn't do those kinds of things in our kind of church. Now, I should have just let it sit there. <laughs> but I didn't. I said as gently as I could that I thought cigarettes in our parking lot was a good thing. Uh, she didn't like that very much. I said it was exactly those kinds of kids that were, that's the point. That's who we're trying to reach. I'd rather have the cigarette butts in our parking lot than somewhere else. And I said it that way because I sensed a little bit of an attitude of older brother lostness in her tone. Verse 25, now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing, and he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come, and your father's killed the fattened calf because he's received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, look, these many years I have served you, and I've never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours comes, who devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed a fattened calf for him. The older brother's lostness was also unintentional. Okay? He's not trying to get lost. In fact, he doesn't think he's lost at all. He thinks everyone else is lost. He's pretty convinced he's right. He sees himself as good and righteous, and he doesn't realize that his own goodness has become his idol. The truth is, he is prodigal, He's extravagantly wasteful in his own pride and self-righteousness. And he's lost. And his lostness, too, is disastrous. Why? He's lost because he misunderstands obedience. He obeys his father not because he loves his father, but because he wants something from him. You never even gave me a goat, he says. He's lost because he misunderstands his father's love. He thinks it's based on his performance. I've been good. I never disobeyed you. He misunderstands sonship. His sonship to his father is not based on his performance. It's based on relationship. And he doesn't wind up with the pigs in the far country. He winds up somewhere maybe even worse than that because he winds up filled with bitterness and anger and resentment. And he winds up alone in his own home and the party has started without him because he does not recognize his lostness like many people today i've become um, sort of attached dependent on my smartphone to get me places when i drive right how many of you do that you know you just get in your car instead of looking up you don't look at an atlas anymore you don't have to look at maps you just say siri take me to you know uh, United Center, and the lady who lives inside your phone then starts to talk to you and direct you places. Well, a few months ago, my wife and I were visiting our son, one of our sons in Minneapolis, uh, and we're not familiar with that city, so we had a free morning, so we, we had heard that there's a really pretty lake somewhere, it had a walking path, and you should go do that. And so we got the coordinates of the park, put them in the phone, and just started following the, the lady's voice that lives in our phone. And, and it was a big lake, walking path, p- major park, waterfall, on Lake Minnehaha, something like that. So we're, we're, we're driving and listening, and we drive and drive and drive, turning right, turn left, turn right, right in 100 yards, turn left, turn right. And we, all of a sudden, both of our phones, we had them both going. And they both say, your destination is on the right. We stop, and we're in the middle of a little, 
a little neighborhood, like a little suburban neighborhood. There's homes, driveways, there's no lake, there's no water, there's no park, there's no nothing. So, that we, so we turned our phones off, restarted, and did it again. Drove around. Your, your destination is on the right. We're in the same neighborhood. We were like in the lost hole of GPS systems or something. And, and so we realized we were lost the whole time and didn't even know it. That's what's happening here to the older brother. The only cure for older brother lostness is what? Repentance. Same thing. But he refuses to recognize his lostness. The father comes out to him, to him and entreats him. Nope, not coming in. Not if you got your son. Doesn't even call him his brother. Not because of that. He refuses to repent from his pride. He refuses to celebrate his brother's return. He refuses his father's love. He insists on staying lost. That's the older brother lostness. Now we have one more character to talk about, and that is the prodigal father. Back to verse 20. And he arose and came to his father, the younger son. And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran toward him, embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But his father said to his servants, quickly, bring the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now I've said it several times, prodigal means extravagant, excessive, profligate. The younger brother is prodigal in his rebellion. The older brother is prodigal in his pride and self-righteousness. The father is prodigal, extravagant, excessive in his love and forgiveness. Notice the father's response. The younger son has insulted him terribly by demanding his inheritance early. He's basically saying, I wish you were dead, and since you're not yet, just give me my stuff. Incredibly insulting in that culture. The younger son has sinned against him, hurt him deeply, but when the younger son admits his lostness and is coming down the road and repents, the father is waiting. He's waiting with grace. Because the way home is repentance, and the way home is repentance because the way home is also grace. The father waits. The father watches. It says, while he was still a long way off. What's that tell us? What has the father been doing since the younger son left? Watching. Watching. If you're a parent, you know exactly what this means. He's sitting on the porch. He's looking down that driveway. He's looking down that road, and he's waiting. He's watching. He's watching. Maybe someday the broken form of my son will start down that road again. And when he comes, I'm going to be ready. He's watching for him. The son is hoping to be received as a slave, as a servant. The father goes way beyond his expectations. He receives him as son. The younger son knows he doesn't deserve even a seat at the table. He throws, he kills the fatted calf. He knows he doesn't deserve to be called his son or receive blessing. He puts the ring on his finger, a sign that he's been restored to the family. Imagine what the tax collectors and sinners are hearing at this part of the story. He's talking about us. He's talking about us. He's saying that despite all we've done, despite all my sin, despite all my rebellion, there's a way home. The Father will receive me back. Yes, He will. Just turn around. He's waiting for you with grace. And notice the Father offers the same grace to the older brother. He says, everything I have is yours. Everything I have is yours. And in the story, it's the older brother, not the younger, who stays lost. He's angry and refused to go in. Finally, we see the way home is joy. What I notice here, and I'm a father, is that when the son comes walking down the road, I try to put myself in that father's shoes. The son, I don't know how long he's been waiting. The son comes walking down the road. What I notice most is the father in the story doesn't, doesn't give the old lecture. Wouldn't that be a great place for a lecture? <laughs> Young man, this is what I tried to tell you all those years, but you know, you never listen. You wound up, so young man, this is going forward from this point on. Here's how it's going to be, right? What a great place for a fatherly lecture. It never shows up. 
The father just says, he throws himself on his son. He kisses him. Let's celebrate. He was dead, and he's alive again. That's a picture of the God we were worshiping tonight. That's the picture of the good, good father. Not the lecture, the grace. Gilligan's Island, I, I don't know how many, I probably saw every episode, probably. Gilligan's Island always made me a little bit sad because, you know, Gilligan and the skipper and the Howells and the professor and Ginger and Marianne, right? That's all of them. They, they never made it home. They never got back. You know, they showed the boat. Fix the hole in the boat. You know, the professor could make a radio out of coconuts. P fix the hole in the boat. Get home. But they never did. Obviously, the show had to keep going and all that. But it made me sad. They never get home. We've been saying all year long in the story of Jesus that these stories are in our Bible for a reason. And the reason is we're in them, especially the parables. With each of these parables of Jesus, you don't understand them until you find yourself in the story. You don't. If, this, you, if you think the story's about someone else, you haven't understood it yet because you're in the story. And all of us are in this one. Maybe as the younger brother. Maybe there's a way in which you're in the far country. Maybe not eating with the pigs, but you're in a little bit of rebellion. You're insisting on doing at least this part of it your way. And you're not trusting your father. You haven't listened to him. Or maybe you're the older brother. Maybe you aren't out there in the far country spending your life in riotous living. You're right here in the walls of the church. But maybe your heart has become somewhat convinced of your own goodness. Maybe you find yourself looking, I'm glad I'm not like those people out there. I hope they never come into my church. I hope they don't live in these cigarette butts in our parking lot. And the way home for both the older brother and the younger brother is repentance. Recognize, turn around, come home. The Father's waiting. Your Father says there's joy in heaven, more joy in heaven when one sinner repents than in 99 who need no repentance. Or maybe you're here tonight, today, as in the, you're in the position of the father. That is, you're waiting for a prodigal to come home. I think there's great encouragement in this story for you. The father waits. We don't know for how long. Weeks, months, was it years? Jesus doesn't say, and I think he doesn't say on purpose, because sometimes it can take a long, long time. But the father waits, and he waits with a broken heart, I believe. And he waits, and he watches, and I think that's kind of a form of prayer. Again, if you're a parent, you know what that prayer is like. It's a waiting kind of prayer. But he waits and he prays. And when he finally sees the broken form of his son staggering down the driveway, he doesn't see a prodigal. He doesn't see a failure. He doesn't put together the lecture. He sees a son, once dead, now alive. And he celebrates. There's hope in this story for you. The way home is repentance, the way home is grace, and the way home is joy. Would you bow as we close tonight? Lord, I thank you for this beautiful story. It's a timeless story, so well constructed. We could study writing for 20 years and never write a story like this. Some of us know what it's like to be in the far country, and we, we can remember those days. Thank you for receiving us home again. Some of us know what it's like to be lost much closer to home. Some of us today know someone who is lost, and we are the ones who are waiting. Thank you for leaving the door open. Thank you for provide, pro providing a way home. Thank you for waiting for us and for the those that we love. Thank you for receiving us as your children. Thank you for your grace. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.